Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Um, we are so excited to be um, working in partnership with Ian. Ian is um, with the Bureau of Developmentally of Developmental Disability Services, um, or BEADS. You might hear people refer to them as the BEADS office. Um, and we are excited to learn more about the Medicaid waivers. So um, Ian, thank you so much for being here. I will do a quick intro. My name is Vicki Lehman. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist at Child Care Answers. We are the local child care resource and referral agency for Hamilton, Hendricks, and Marion counties. Um, we're aiming to assure the highest level of early childhood education for children in central Indiana. We work with families, we work with community agencies and businesses and child care professionals. I will make sure that I put my info in the chat box. So if you have any questions for me about who we are, what we do and how we can help, you can always reach out to me and I would be happy to get connected with you. Without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Ian. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, like Vicki said, my name is Ian Reagans, and I'm the district manager with Bureau of Developmental Disability Services. Um, the area that my office serves is the greater Indianapolis area, so Marion County, Hamilton, Boone, Hendricks, Johnson, Morgan, Shelby, and Hancock counties. Um, our contact information will be listed in the last slide, and I'll also make sure that uh, Vicki gets that separately as well, so she can share that. So first up, Medicaid waivers are what's known as home and community-based services. Home and community-based services provide opportunities for individuals with disabilities to receive Medicaid-funded supports and services in their home and community rather than inside institutions or other isolated settings. Each state operates their own waiver systems, and here in Indiana, BEADS administers two waivers to individuals with intellectuals, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Those are the Family Support Waiver and the Community, community Integration and Habilitation Waiver. Um, it's important to remember that we're only talking about the waivers that BEADS administers today. Um, there are waivers with uh, other divisions, such as the Division of Aging for individuals who have extensive medical needs. If you want information on those waivers, you can reach out to your uh, local area agency on aging. Hey, Ian, quick question. So somebody wanted to know, is this info relevant to all counties in the state of Indiana? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about eligibility for these waivers, a diagnosis alone doesn't automatically qualify an, an individual for a waiver. So for both waivers, an individual must have an intellectual or a developmental disability with an onset prior to the age of 22 years old. They must also meet our level of care. So after a person submits an application, we will reach out and schedule a time to uh, do an interview. We are currently doing um, our interviews uh, virtually unless there is an extenuating circumstance. We are doing some in person, but for the most part, they are um, we are using virtual as well. Um, so in that interview, we ask, questions about major life areas. So those are listed here on this slide. Uh, Self-care, learning, self-direction, capacity for independent living, and understanding and use of language, and also mobility. So from the answers, we determine if a person meets our level of care based on the, the answers that we receive there. So to do that uh, and to be eligible, um, we are looking for at least three of six major life areas having a limitation. Uh, additionally, in order to have a waiver, you also have to have a compatible category of Medicaid. So for children under the age of 18 years old, uh, household income requirements are frequently something that really parents freak out about. So in, in this case, uh, we want you to know that for a child under the age of 18, that parental income is disregarded. So for individuals aged 18 years and above, they will have to apply for and be approved for SSI. Um, and at that point, there is a, a different determination uh, that takes place for Medicaid as well. So um, we like to be involved in that process. If, and if you guys have questions, um, we, we actually request that you guys do reach out and talk to us because we can help with some of that. So if you don't already have 
Medicaid at the time of application, uh, the BEADS office will advise you when the appropriate time is to apply during the application process. Um, so again, something that, that we like to have a little involvement with there because we can help with that Medicaid process. I'm gonna highlight uh, the waivers now. So the first one that I'm gonna highlight is the Community Integration and Habilitation Waiver. So to be eligible for the CIH waiver, uh, an individual must meet all of the eligibility criteria discussed in the previous slide and must also meet one or more pri uh, priority category that's established in the Indiana Code. So Indiana Code also states that in addition to these cri criteria, it has to be determined that an alternative placement in a supervised group living setting is not available or is inappropriate or is an inappropriate option as determined by the division director. So that priority criteria is listed here on the screen. So individuals transitioning to the community from a nursing facility, an extensive supported needs facility, or a state operated facility are, those are all facilities that we're, we're looking at. Sorry. Um, an individual determined to no longer need or receive active treatment in supervised group living. Uh, individuals transitioning from 100% state funded services. Individuals aging out of Department of Education, Department of Child Services, or again, supervised group living settings. Individuals requesting to leave large private intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Uh, death of a primary caregiver where there's no other caregiver available. Caregivers over the age of 80 years old when there's no other caregiver available. Evidence of abuse or neglect in current institutional or supervised group living placements. Or an extraordinary health and safety risk as reviewed and approved by our division director. So if an individual is approved for the CIH waiver, then the individual's budget is determined using an algorithm which takes into consideration their age, their living arrangement, their health status, and their support needs. Those are all things that we reach out about and gather information on to try and make um, an accurate determination on, on what the level of support really is. So to apply for this waiver, individuals or guardians need to reach out to BEADS uh, to the district office that covers you. And again, in these counties, that's our office and request an application for the CIH waiver. If somebody is already on the family support waiver, they can also reach out to their case manager and can request that from them as well. So next up is the family support waiver or the FSW waiver. The family support waiver currently operates on a wait list uh, to find out where you are on the wait list, uh, you can reach out to BEADS to our district offices. Um, we hope to have a wait list portal available in the future, um, but it is not up yet. We have also just recently moved our application process online. So uh, once an individual is determined eligible, they're placed on our wait list. It's important to keep your contact information up to date with us as well so that when the person's name does come up on our wait list that we're able to um, reach out and uh, communicate that and get that process moving. You can contact us to update your contact information and uh, we're happy to do that anytime. Just our general number will be enough to, to get that changed. Or if you're working with a particular coordinator, you can always reach out to them as well. The Family Support Waiver has a maximum annual budget of $17,300 to use towards waiver services. So a waiver case manager will assist in determining what services uh, you might be interested in receiving and how that fits into that budget. Individuals who are 18 to 24 years old who have exited the school setting or are children of uh, active or veteran members of the United States Armed Forces or National Guard may qualify for a priority category, which does allow them to move to the top of that wait list. So if you or your family members fall under one of those criteria, you can let us know at the time of application so we can make sure that that's honored. Uh, next up is targeting, which is what we refer to uh, when a person's name reaches the top of that wait list. 
So when that happens, you do receive a letter in the mail uh, that indicates that you've been targeted and that um, we're, we ask at that time that you do fill out the document that we send and return it to us that just indicates whether or not you're still interested in receiving those services. Um, it's really important that you respond to that letter and indicate whether or not you want to move forward. Um, you can also call us and let us know at the time if you, you know, don't want to mail, mail something back or can't do it. You can also reach out to us and, and we can enter that, um, you know, just through contacting our office. Um, if the time of the application to the time of the targeting does exceed 12 months, we do um, have to complete a new level of care screening. So uh, just as a reminder, that screening is when we um, look at those six categories and determine that, that limitation um, in those, those six major life areas. And then once we determine eligibility, the bead service coordinator will provide you with a list of case management companies. Uh, that's what's called a pick list. Uh, you take that list home and begin the process of calling those case management companies to see which one you think will be a good fit for you and your family. Uh, at the time, think about what you want from your case manager, what's important to you. Um, you can ask questions such as what is the preferred method of communication? Uh, what's their average response time to questions and concerns? How are crisis situations handled? How do they assist you in finding and building supports in the community? Uh, how do they ensure that you and your family's needs are always the first consideration? Those are just a few examples of possible topics uh, and questions that you can ask. Um, those, again, those are just questions to ask those potential case management companies to determine which one might be the right fit for you. Uh, keep in mind as well that you can change that company um, anytime that you want. If something doesn't work out with them, uh, if you know that particular case manager uh, turns out to, to not be right for you, you can change that at any time. Um, in those cases, you generally it's a hard conversation to tell your case manager that you don't want to work with them anymore. So you can reach out to our office and we can help process that change. So at the same time <clears throat> that the bead service coordinator uh, is working on your case, they may also direct you to apply for Medicaid if you don't already have it in place. Again, due to those special rules associated with uh, Medicaid and individuals receiving a waiver, it's important that you wait until um, we tell you that it's time if you haven't already. Uh, that way we can um, make sure that we let them know that you're a person where we're not going to consider, uh, consider parental income. and. Uh, if, and it does happen, if there are issues during that Medicaid process at the time, we're, we're happy to help you work through that as well. So once Medicaid's approved and the referral is made to a chosen case management company, uh, you'll then work with that case management company to create what's called a person-centered individualized support plan. And you'll choose what waiver services will support you in living your vision of a good life. Ian, we do have a question. Okay. Um, so if you don't use the annual amount or don't need any services in a particular year, is that okay? Yes. So if you're not using the full budget, that's okay. You would still be using case management. That is a, it, it, it is considered a mandatory support um, built within the framework of that system. So case management would still come out of that budget, um, even if you're not using other services. We really wanna see that you guys are working um, towards getting some services in place or trying to um, see how it can be used. There are lots of different ways to utilize that waiver. Um, so that case manager is gonna be really important to talk to if you're thinking you don't need any particular support during that time. Um, but, but we do wanna see that, that the services that you know, we're, we're approving do, do get used in some way. Um, but again, that's something to, to discuss individually with, with case managers because we do know that, you know, there are, are circumstances where maybe it's just not needed. So definitely work with your case manager if that's the case. So we'll jump to the Person-Centered Individualized Support Plan or PCISP. So uh, when, when this comes up, you and your case manager work to create that. Um, this is a document that will grow and change over time. Um, you may hear it referred to as a living document. 
Um, it begins with your vision for a good life and you will work with that case manager to chart a path for the um, support team to follow um, when supporting you or your family member. So it helps to identify what waiver supports as well as what community resources, technology, current relationships, uh, and other things that you can access to meet those needs and, and help build upon strengths. Uh, this will be done when you first begin waiver services, and it's reviewed at least semi-annually by the individualized support team. And then it's updated annually, although, again, because it's a living document, it can be updated any time uh, a situation changes or needs arise. Uh, the PCISP must also be written in plain language and in a manner, manner accessible to individuals with disabilities and persons who may have a, a limited language proficiency. The key part of the PCISP includes an about me section, uh, an identification of their life stage, and a desire for each of their life domains. So the About Me section describes the individual strengths uh, and gifts, as well as things they do well, sources of pride, uh, and qualities about them that are the most valued, appreciated, and respected pieces of their life. Uh, along with this is also their vision of their good life, so what they're looking for, and where they want to be now and in the future, and what they want to do. So this set, sets the stage for how the waiver can be used to best support them. Uh, this vision may include, may include portions of their current reality that he or she wants to preserve and sustain, uh, as well as desired changes, um, especially when we're talking about um, kids growing up and, and becoming adults. Uh, there are a lot of desired changes and, and we wanna help them build strengths to, to, to make that possible when the time does come. So just a, a quick look at some of the life stages. Um, when developing the PCISP, it's important to consider what stage the person's in and what's happened in their past. Um, you know, what happens to us early on in our lives can have a significant impact on our quality of life and well-being in the future. So identifying and discussing the life stage allows an individual, family, and other team members to explore how past experiences currently affect the person um, or you know, may have a positive or negative effect uh, on them in the future. Those life stages can be broken down into six categories. Uh, infancy, uh, transition from school to adult life, early childhood, adulthood, uh, school age, aging. Uh, so those are our, our six life stages. Um, and, and we know that life is messy and complex. Uh, it involves many different layers and it's important to recognize how uh, they connect and affect each other. So when developing the PCISP, the life domains are really explored as a way to discover um, what supports are needed as well as what you may have. Um, a lot of people find it hard to um, pick out the things that they have. Um, so we want to want to help highlight those things as well. Um, so the seven life domains are daily life and employment. Um, so what a person does as part of their everyday life, whether that be school, employment, volunteering, communication, routines, uh, other life skills, um, community living. So where and how someone lives. So their housing, their living options, uh, community access, transportation, um, home adaptations and modifications are, are things that would fall into this category as well. Uh, safety and security. <clears throat> so staying safe and secure with finances, emergencies, uh, their general well-being, um, perhaps uh, decision-making supports or uh, other legal rights and issues that, that may, may pop up around that. Um, healthy living. So managing and accessing health care and staying well, um, medical supports, mental health supports, behavior supports, um, wellness and nutrition, uh, those are all things that, that fall into this. Um, another one that we're going to highlight is social and spirituality. So building friendships and relationships, uh, leisure activities, uh, personal networks and their faith community. And then the last category is citizenship and advocacy. So um, building valued roles and making choices, 
setting goals, assuming responsibility, and um, really driving how they live their own life. Um, some other areas of important that, importance that may come up here <clears throat> would be just their wants, their desires, um, other situations that maybe don't fit into any of these criteria or any of these domains. Um, so those will also be discussed as well. And then with all of this together, um, this is used to guide the person and their team in um, really developing the plan from that point to make sure it's meaningful because we wanna make sure that, that all of this you know, really is meaningful to the person and helps provide them with appropriate services um, and supports that, that really you know, let, let them work towards um, what their desired life really is. Um, I, I keep talking about the individualized support team. So just, just to kind of highlight who can be in that, um, there's really not a limit as long as that person is, um, you know, important to the, the person that we're talking about. Um, so the person being served, they're going to be on this team. Uh, their parents or their guardians, um, other family members, the case manager. Um, if you are using, you know, multiple service providers, those service providers are also going to be part of that team. It can also be anyone else selected by uh, the individual or by their guardian. So in some cases, you know, it can be a teacher, uh, it can be, you know, a, a close family friend who is an advocate. Um, it, it's really going to be up to the team to choose the right people to um, help support this person. So uh, when we're talking about services. Um, uh, there are a few examples of the services uh, that are available listed on this uh, slide. Um, these are going to be available through both the Family Support Waiver and the CIH Waiver. Uh, the services are designed to provide access and support to you and your family member in living out your vision of a good life uh, in the home and the community. Uh, the case manager assists you in understanding these services and will help guide you in picking services that are meaningful. Uh, through this process, your case manager will also guide you on other resources that may exist within the community, um, whether that be through uh, other formal service delivery systems or through use of technology. Um, they'll also help you look at strengths uh, as an individual and family, uh, you know, what you bring to the table as well that can help um, support the person. Uh, so waiver services are an important piece of the puzzle in providing appropriate supports, but it's also equally important to identify all those possible and available resources that you or your loved one um, may have that, you know, are, are to just make sure things are comprehensive and, and integrated and, and sustainable because we want it to work long term. Uh, again, I, I talked about this a little bit before, but I want to highlight again that, that there are choices um, in, in service providers for this. So there is a requirement of case, manage case management, but you, you do still have a choice in that as well. Um, but if you, you know, choose a, a provider and things don't work out, you, you can make a change. You would just need to reach out to your case manager and, and work on um, you know, finding a different provider that would offer that service. Uh, there is a pick list on this screen, just so you can get an idea of what it might look like. Um, I know it is tiny and I'm sorry about that. But just like when you choose a case management company, um, you would be asked to choose a provider for any of these waiver services from a pick list. Um, the pick list will have the name, the phone number, and the address of the company who has identified themselves as providing that service in your county. So when contacting possible service providers, it would be helpful to ask if they've got available staff, um, are they available on uh, the days and times that meet your needs, and you know, do they currently have a wait list because some providers do have wait lists from time to time. Uh, it's also helpful to think about what's important to you and your family and um, what you hope to achieve from using that service. 
Um, by doing so, you can identify questions that would be helpful um, when speaking to those potential service providers. You can also talk to other individuals and family members and you know, maybe ask them to share their experiences. If you know, they're, they've been working with any particular providers, um, also, be sure to take notes as you work through a pick list so as not to confuse or forget anything important from your conversations with them. Uh, also, keep in mind that, again, you're able to, to change those service providers at any time for any reason. So just let your case manager know and they can provide you with a new pick list. Uh, on this slide, there are just a few additional questions that you can consider when you're choosing a provider. So just a, a few things off of here is, you know, it, how do they handle medications? So if, if it's a staff where perhaps they're working um, in your home or, you know, having, having a need to pass a medication, um, how do they maintain that? How do they document it? Um, what's their policy? Uh, should there be an emergency? Um, what would they do if a staff called off um, from, from working with whoever that person is? How would they fill that? Um, do they do background checks? Just, just some general things like that are, are all good questions to consider when you're, when you're choosing um, who to work with. And then on this screen is just a list of our district offices. We do, we have moved our applications online. Um, it is BEADS Gateway, B-D-D-S Gateway dot fssa dot in dot gov. I will put that in there. Um, and once that application is processed online, it does get sent over to a service coordinator and they usually reach out within a couple of weeks to get things set up with you. Um, so if there are any any questions during that application process, which we've only been doing for, for one month now, so we have had some questions pop up, you can always reach out to us by phone and we're happy to help work through that process as well. Thank you so much, Ian.